Good morning. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. My name is Tracy Anderson, and I'm a member of the Spotlight Health team. And we just hope you're having a great time here at the conference, learning new things, meeting new people, and just sparking curiosity. And this morning, it is my tremendous pleasure to be able to introduce our next speaker, Stephen Keating. Stephen recently earned his PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT. His research involved developing new forms of product design, digital fabrication, and additive fabrication techniques, which resulted in the design and construction of an 8,000-pound robot that can be transported to a site and print 3D architectural structures. It's truly amazing. He has a video. Check it out. Curiosity is present in all aspects of Stephen's life and it helped him through a surprising medical experience, which was brain cancer. Due to that curiosity, paired with his personal and academic experiences, he has become a patient advocate and is participating in this important work on a policy level, and he recently participated in the Federal Precision Medicine Task Force. Please help me welcome Dr. Stephen Keating. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, how are you guys doing? Uh, good, good, good. I appreciate you coming out early in the morning, and it's gonna be talking about brain cancer, which is not the most brightening topic, but I'm gonna try to make it one, all right? So we're becoming more digital every year, right? We are generating more digital data. We are coming up with more tools to use and benefit from that data, and we are sharing more data. For example, what's one of the most common types of data that we all generate every day? You guys are probably generating some of it today as well. It's photos, right? Every year we're actually uploading and sharing over 650 billion photos, right? And what's the most common type of photo that we upload? A selfie, someone said it, very good. So we are an egotistical species. We like data about ourselves. We're curious about ourselves. 30% of photos that we upload and share are selfies. And I know it's early in the morning, so I thought we'd start by fitting the trend and taking a selfie. And I'm going to make a goofy face. This is going to be a talk about brain cancer. So I thought we'd start out by getting a little goofy, OK? So I want to see your goofy faces. Please, I always try to see who, which talks, which audiences can be the most creative. So I'm counting on you to back me up on this. Ready? So here we go, starting out the talk. Do something goofy. <laughs> okay, thank you. thank you guys. So you'll note I just took that picture on my phone, right? And a phone is a tool and we're using it with apps, right? So apps are tools, which is a camera. Turn my phone into a camera. And if you actually look on the phone, there's over two million apps available, two million tools. And believe it or not, 90% of those are free, right? You can turn your phone into a translator. You can turn it into a constellation guide pointing at the stars. You can turn into a cosmic ray detector at the push of a button. Two million options, 90% free. It's amazing, right? And what happens when we share that data? Well, we get things like, for example, Wikipedia. There's over 40 million articles. And when I grew up, my family had that whole printed set of encyclopedias, right? I'm guessing a lot of you guys had those books too. Wikipedia is 60 times larger than the second largest encyclopedia, right? So this is what happens when we're share, when we create things for all, by all, right? So we're living in this amazing digital era. And so where's healthcare, right? You know, we'd think, you know, healthcare's gotta be right up there. And I was absolutely shocked when I went through a, a recent medical experience with brain cancer at where medicine and healthcare are. And I'm guessing many of you guys have been shocked about this too, especially if you've tried to access your patient data. So for example, hospitals are one of the largest consumers of fax machines. Believe it or not, I'm almost guessing no one in this audience uses faxes at their home anymore. But hospitals, it's a primary way to transfer data because they don't speak the same languages. So when I was visiting multiple hospitals in the same city, they would have to fax each other or they would send me in my car with a CD to move data around because they couldn't speak to each other, right? And even though I could access my data, everyone in this room can access clinical data through the HIPAA policy. So just know that you have the legal right to access your clinical data. But there's all these little barriers in the way. And for a patient, 
a small barrier is a mountain, right? So you have to fill out paperwork. You have to wait in the mail. Uh, I had to wait two or three weeks, and it came on 20 to 30 CDs, right? I don't have a CD reader. I went and got a CD uh, reader. And then, of course, uh, when I upload all the data, I have no way to use it, right? It's hundreds of pages of scanned notes. It's genetic data. It's MRI data, which there's no easy tool. It's not like our two million apps on the phone where you can do all kinds of amazing things. It's this really complex file on my computer that I have no idea how to use, right? And there's legal gray zones, and I'll dive into this later, but there are certain types of data that, you, that patients actually can't access about themselves, uh, research types of data, and I'll get into that in a minute. And there's a lack of translucency, right? Where's the Yelp to have feedback on which hospitals to go to? Where's the Uber, which you can see where your car is so that if your doctor's running late, you're not waiting around for two hours. You can say, oh, I'm, I'm going to go get a sandwich because my doctor's here and he's running a little late, or she's running late, right? There's, there's a lack of translucency. How many of you know how much your treatments cost, right? You don't because the insurance takes care of it, right? There's a very lack of translucency. And so when I went through this experience, I kept asking this question, why can't there be a hospital share button, right? What would people share? Would it be helpful? And let's go back to what people share the most, a selfie. What would a medical selfie look like? Well, this is a medical selfie of my brain cancer experience very, very quickly. So this is my family and I after my surgery. Here we can zoom in. There's my skull. There's my brain. Dive down through the MRIs. There's my tumor. This is them cutting open my brain. If we dive into the tissue, that's my brain tissue, and it's an astrocytoma, and there's the IDH1 protein. This is the one that had the single point mutation that drove my cancer. It was a G that turned into an A that drove my cancer. It was not in my genes from my family. It was a random mutation. I'm sorry to say this. This could happen to any of you tomorrow. So this is, uh, uh, that selfie allowed me to kind of understand what was happening, right? And it actually goes back, this whole story, to 2007. And it was curiosity that actually helped save my life. So I was growing up, that huge nerd taking apart random TVs and VCRs and gathering as much data as I could. And you know, when I went to college, I realized this amazing thing. The researchers are always lacking participants. So if you ever want to get involved in research or see what it's like, if you're curious about yourself or about research, just go to a university, look on the bulletin boards, and they are often so desperate to find participants that they will actually even pay you. So I would always check out different studies and participate, and I always wanted to see my brain. So in 2007, I volunteered for a research study looking at the fear response of the brain. And they actually paid me $50. So you know, if you're going to the hospital now and you're paying $5,000 to get an MRI, you can actually help science. They might pay you. And if you ask nicely, they might give you the data. So I asked to see the results, and they said, uh, here's the results. And by the way, if you look in the top right corner, there's a small white area. And it's, we don't really know what it is. You might want to get it checked out. So I got it checked out by a neurologist in 2007. They said, we don't know what it is. You have no symptoms. A lot of people have abnormalities in their brain that never affect them. Let's get it checked out in a few years, see if there's any change. So I went back in 2010, got it re-scanned. There was no change in the abnormality. So the doctor said, there's no change over three years, no need to worry. Uh, it's, you have no effects from this abnormality. Life goes on. Great. So I went to MIT. I started grad school. And in 2014, I started to smell a very faint vinegar smell for a few seconds every day. And it was kind of like when you hit your elbow and it goes tingly for a few seconds. It was like that, but a smell. So a very, very faint vinegar smell, very few seconds, and it was gone. And after about the third time I was lying in bed, it was about 2 AM, and I smelt it. And I got up. No one was in the kitchen. No one was cooking. And I was like, that's just so weird. And I remembered I had that brain data from 2007. So I pulled it up. And I did Google searching. And I, and I realized, wow, the smell center of the brain is right near where that abnormality is. I wonder if it's linked. And of course, I kind of thought I might be a little crazy about that. But I figured it's worth checking out. So I went to the MIT doctors, explained the story. They said, you don't have any symptoms. There's really no need. But I pushed. And they said, OK, we'll book a scan. And they booked it for a month later, because they weren't really concerned. Uh, this is what it looked like a month later. So the tumor had grown to about 10% of my brain. Uh, that's the top view. This is the view from behind. Uh, and these are actually 3D prints of, of a one-to-one -one scale of what they cut out of my head, about 10% of my frontal left lobe. Um, and uh, so three weeks later, uh, I had a 10-hour awake brain surgery. And the reason it was an awake surgery is because it was right near my language center. 
So they want me talking during the operation so that if my words garble, they stop cutting those areas. Uh, and of course, I was curious, so I said, would you be okay if this was videotaped? And the neurosurgeon, who didn't have to say yes, was very kind and said, okay. Uh, so I know it's early in the morning, so close your eyes if you don't want to see this. Though, if you listen, you're going to hear me talking during the surgery. There's going to be a 30-second version of a 10-hour awake brain surgery. Okay, so here we go. Close your eyes if you don't want to see this. It's going to be a little gory. So this is me lying there. Uh, here they are cutting open my skull, um, opening up the brain. I don't know if you can hear what I'm saying. I'm saying, how are you guys doing to the doctors? Brain exposed. We're actually measuring. Just some um, hope And here they're going to be actually probing. So here you can see them probing the brain to see where my language center is. And I'm lying there with my head open saying how cool it was to feel them inside my brain, which was a bizarre experience. Here they are cutting out the tumor, um, putting in basically a, a, a cover and screwing me back together. And 10 hours later, uh, I survived, and I was really lucky to and, and grateful to have an amazing medical team at the Brigham Women's in Hospital uh, in Boston. And actually, one week later, I was back on campus at, at MIT, and I did. Uh, oh, you don't need to clap. You can clap for the doctors. <laughs> you, can clap, you can clap for the doctors. Uh, and I did a, a year of chemotherapy and, and proton radiation. And for those of you who don't know what proton radiation is, I got to tell you because it's as the nerd in me is like, this is so interesting. They take protons, which are little pieces of matter, okay? It's actually hydrogen. They pull away the electrons. So it's little pieces of matter. They spin it up in a particle accelerator. They spin it up to one-third the speed of light, 300 million miles per hour, physical little particles, little bits of sand, basically, little particles, and then they shoot it at your face. And it actually goes in, and it basically lands where the tumor is, and it, it serves to kind of cause mutations that prevent the tumor from regrowing. Uh, but the really interesting thing, and you can see me here, it's basically you lie in this room and you're by yourself, and when the proton beam fires, it actually can sometimes stimulate the optical nerve. So I would see in my left eyeball very, very faint blue lightning bolts and fireworks, and that was literally these protons hitting my brain and triggering my optical nerve. And of course, being the huge geek in me, I had to capture this, so I brought in camera and put a, a dark lens, and this is actually kind of, for those of you who know about particle physics, these are actually like cloud chamber traces. So these are the little particles coming out of my brain that are spreading across. And believe it or not, for certain types of subatomic particles, you can't stop them with anything, with concrete. So you could actually measure across the river at MIT when the proton beam was on because parts of my brain were crossing through the river and hitting MIT, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Uh, and anyways, and I would actually be radioactive after that. So the, the geek in me would take out my Geiger counter, and for about five to six hours after, it wasn't dangerous to anyone, but I could measure radioactivity in my own brain, right? It's weird. Anyway, so as you can tell, I was gathering a huge amount of data, right? I wanted to be able to have enough data to make decisions. Because one of the things I realized is that the patient has to be their own advocate, right? It's up to me how long I do chemo. The UK does it differently than the US. It's up to me to figure out if I want x-rays or protons. It's up to me to figure out what clinical trials I want to look at. And the doctors have different recommendations, right? And so the patient has to be their own best advocate. And I collected all of this data. It was clinical data, research data, and data I was generating on myself, over 200 gigabytes. So I was even sampling my poop, believe it or not, and, and doing microbiome analysis. So the bacteria in your stomach, you can take your poop, believe it or not, and sequence that and see what kind of bacteria are in your stomach. So I was doing that before, during, and after chemotherapy because it totally kills a whole amount of bacteria in your stomach and rechanges your, your biology. Uh, anyway, so I learned all these amazing things. It helped me make decisions. It helped me understand my, my condition. And, and I shared all this data online. I shared it so that I could get others to help me. I could share it with other surgeons. I actually switched surgeons because I put it online and had recommendations of who to go with. Uh, and it was helpful for my family to see what I was going through. And now it's helpful for others who are going through the same kind of brain cancer situation to see, okay, here's what he did, here's what the outcomes were, here's what that experience is like, right? But the most interesting and surprising thing I learned wasn't a technical or scientific lesson. It was, how come it was so hard to get that data? How come the doctors can see my data? How come the researchers can see the data, but I can't? How come I have to go through so many barriers? Like I said, 
There's tons of these barriers everywhere, and for most patients, if you have to wait two weeks in the mail and get 30 CDs, that's it. If you have to figure out and basically become a, a medical student to understand your data, that's way too many barriers. If it takes more than an hour to get your data, most patients will never do it, right? Because they trust the doctor, right? Um, and it's very, very complex. Like I said, there's no standards. So hospitals don't talk to each other. So I recently moved from Boston to the Bay Area. And luckily, I had all my data because at Stanford, they couldn't accept the pathology data. So about 25% of the pathology data was missing, but, but I had it, right? And there was these legal gray areas, and I'll dive into this just a little bit here. Uh, so after my surgery, I donated my tissue to many different research studies. And for example, one based out of MIT was wanting to do genome sequencing of my tumor because they wanted to study this mutation, and I was thrilled. I'm doing my minor in synthetic biology at the time, so I'm interested in DNA. And this can help science, and I'll be able to see my own genome. Or that's what I was told, and that's what I thought. So I, of course, signed the paperwork. At the end of the day, the doctors can see my genome. The researchers at MIT can see my genome. But at the end of the day, I am not allowed. And I know, as a researcher, how valuable brain tissue and any type of tissue that's donated is. And I'm, I can't believe it. Literally, my home university can see my genome in my future and I donated my brain, and I can't. And the doctors and the researchers were on my side. It was the lawyers at the very top because of the CLIA policy. Because this wasn't clinical data, it was research data, and it wasn't done on a CLIA-certified machine, the top lawyers had to say no. And so it was this crazy, weird situation. So I kind of said, well, OK, I'll sequence myself. Can I get a small amount of my brain tissue, right? Can I sequence myself? And of course, the surprising answer is, again, no. When you go into surgery, you sign paperwork that basically says you don't own any of the tissue they cut out of you. So, you know, they cut out a huge part, 10%, and I can't even get a tiny little pin bit of it, right? It's crazy. So it was only available for researchers, so what did I do? I switched into med school, right? I switched <laughs> at MIT into a joint Harvard-MIT med school program, took a year uh, to class in pathology and made it my final research project to get a chunk of my own little brain, and, and I got some. So th this is my own uh, brain. As you can see the blood cells and the astrocytoma cells. And this is truly a selfie, right? Because it's taking pictures of my own brain. A anyways, at the end of the day, MIT was so frustrated with the situation, and they were so supportive of me, the Broad Institute at MIT actually paid to have me resequenced uh, outside of the study and gave the results to me. So I was very grateful for MIT to do that. But it just goes to show all of these things. Like, why is the patient last in line? Every other, every other industry, the consumer's put first. But in health, we're, we're put last, right? Uh, and, and so what you can do with this data is all kinds of things. Like I said, making decisions and, and family support, but also fun things, right? And you can get more engaged. For example, my PhD work was in 3D printing, so I was printing my tumors. I made them into to salt shakers. I made them into bottle openers. Uh, every year, my family gives, my parents give us Christmas tree ornaments. So of course, I, I made some out of glass and I put it in this box, and to see my mom's face when she opened up her Christmas present, and it was my brain tumor, it was like this look of, of horror mixed with hilarity. And uh, so, I mean, you can do very interesting things, right? And, and I could better understand what was happening, and even more so, it actually helped me understand how I was recovering. So, for example, this is my skull. This is how they did the surgery. They went in, cut out that, pulled out the tumor. And for me, the ability to access every scan, I, I still get scans every six months, to, to this day, uh, to be able to see how the skull is healing. So they f would say, don't ride your bike, because if you fall over, your skull might come apart. Well, I could see you know, every three months, every six months, how it was healing. And you know, study after study, again, shows the more engaged a patient is, the more they understand how their treatment is progressing, the more likely they are to follow their treatment. Right? And I took this to the next level, of course. I used, actually, some of my research techniques to look at new ways to 3D print. In, in bitmap format. So basically, to print with multiple materials such that this, uh, you can actually see a quick little video here, we can print with voxels where they have different material properties. So we can actually print my whole head with different stiffness, where the bones are, where the tumor is, where the brain is, uh, not with the traditional STLs. And we actually ended up writing a paper with my neurosurgeon on this, right? So if you give patient access to their data, they can do things you wouldn't expect. 
And I took it to the kind of crazy level. Uh, as uh, Tracy mentioned, this was one of the large projects in my PhD. This is an 8,000 pound robot. Here it is 3D printing a 50 foot dome in 14 hours. Uh, and so it's totally autonomous, it can drive on site, all those fun things. But of course, what I wanted to print was a version of my tumor, right? Raise awareness for brain cancer. Uh, so this is a long exposure light painting showing it kind of the path for making my tumor. And here's a rendering, and hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to print a 50-foot version just to raise awareness for, uh, for brain cancer, right? So you know, these are the kind of fun things that can happen with data, but there's so many more things, right? And, and sharing that data online, like I said, allowed me to have help from others. So at MIT, I was really lucky. There was professors there who were studying my mutation. So Dr. Van der Heiden on the right there was one of them, and because I was sharing my data, he could see what I was going through. He could give it guidance. He could tell me how things are actually working inside my brain. And he actually asked, I was never intending to become a patient advocate. You know, I was literally gathering all this data to stay alive. And he said, you know, after I'd recovered, I'm giving an hour-long talk on this type of mutation. Would you give a five-minute patient perspective? You know, I kind of owed him many things, including like my life. So I said yes, and I gave a five minute talk and I couldn't believe the response. It actually led to this crazy path that I've just been kind of on because it seems to be helping other people. Uh, and it was actually, it got such a response, it led to a, a, a front page story in the New York Times on April 1st, which is my favorite holiday, April Fool's Day. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it, it was like, un, it was crazy. Uh, my six years of PhD work making a giant robot, you know, no impact, but getting brain cancer, New York Times. Anyways, uh, that article comes out, I get over a thousand emails that day. And this really cements that this is a huge, huge issue. It wasn't just from patients, it was from doctors and researchers and patients. And they all said, this is a huge problem, this matters. And so from there, I kind of just kept asking these questions, you know. Uh, and, and surprisingly, I did this 49 days of proton radiation, like I said, and it made me slightly radioactive. And believe it or not, I got invited to the White House on the last day of treatment, just out of random coincidence. Uh, this was when Obama was launching the Precision Medicine Initiative. So I went, and it was absolutely incredible. I literally rang the bell of the proton to, to finish. They, everyone claps, you ring the bell, got on a plane, and I'm thrilled, thinking this is the best way to end treatment, and I'm in the line, I'm Canadian, so I'm in the international line, and I'm standing there, and there's guys with big guns and dogs, and they're inspecting you, and they've got a Geiger counter. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh no, <laughs> this is how I'm really gonna die, it's not brain cancer, it's going into the White House after brain cancer being radioactive. Uh, and luckily their tools, I was sweating like you couldn't believe, their tools weren't as sensitive and they, I mean, I wasn't dangerous. I wasn't at a dangerous level. Uh, so I went in, but it was kind of one of those things that I'll never forget. Uh, so of course, again, taking selfies, this is what, how happy I was to be finished proton radiation and to be in the, uh, where Obama was, which was really fun. Uh, anyways, uh, it led to all these things. I served on the Precision Medicine Task Force doing policy suggestions of how to get better standardization and access for patients. I've been doing public talks just like this to raise awareness because people need to know this is a problem. People need to know to ask for their data because if you ask now, it might save your life seven years from now, which is what happened to me, right? And uh, you know, even being featured in these kind of short documentary films to put this out there because most people don't realize this problem until they're in it. And then when they're in it, it's the last concern because they're trying to stay alive, right? Uh, and so where does this all go, right? How do you solve this? Well, let's go back to that very initial slide talking about selfies, right? We love selfies. We are so egotistical and curious about ourselves. Maybe could we leverage selfies to save us, right? Could we take advantage of how people are curious about themselves to actually get them to engage? And what I mean by that is here's some quantified data to show this could work. Open Notes was a project that started in 2010 by a nonprofit group, three hospitals. And what it was is they were going to offer electronic doctor's notes in real time. So you would not, not clinical data, so just very small amount, but the doctor's notes. And what they found is at the beginning, there was 100 doctors involved, and they were all very hesitant because they were thinking it's going to cause more questions, it's going to take me time to write in the notes online, we don't really want to do this. So they got 100 doctors to participate, 20,000 patients. After one year, they quantified all the results. And this is really incredible to show that it works. 99% of the patients wanted continued access. 
four out of five said they would only go to a hospital that had open notes. That's how valuable it was to them. 70% said they took better care of themselves because they could actually check their notes and see how many pills they're supposed to take per day or see how their iron levels were increasing. And the doctors, none of them wanted to quit. They actually all reported it reduced the amount of time because there was less questions. Because instead of patients calling the office, they would check the notes, right? And so it had this amazing effect of engaging patients, making better care, and patients even wanted to do more. 60% wanted to add data. They were saying, why can't my Fitbit be put into this system? Why, you know, why can't I input symptoms at home through this? Why can't I have more ability to add information? Right? And so Open Notes is this powerful example. It started in 2010, 20,000 patients. Now over 15 million patients in the US. And this is a tiny, tiny start. It's only doctor's notes. Think about clinical data. Think about the possibilities, not just for patients, but for researchers. So I'm going to highlight a couple other projects. And we're going to do a couple questions at the end. If you want to learn more, we can talk about these. But things like Patients Like Me, where that's an online group with over 500,000 patients. So you can, set, you can find people with your condition that you can say, OK, what clinical trials are you on? Which treatment did you choose? Uh, things like Sage Bio Networks, where citizens can actually access crowdsourced data and actually compete in competitions to win money by solving medical issues. And it's found enormous success in publishing papers that you know, would usually take much longer in a traditional setting. And things like Open Humans, which is a disclaimer, I'm on the board. Uh, it's a nonprofit where we are basically allowing all people to put and connect all types of data. So from you know, dozens of sources, you can connect your, my tw your 23andMe genetic data, your Fitbit, uh, all these different types of data, and then you can develop tools or use tools with that. So all of these things are growing slowly, but very powerfully. And, and it's showing the potential of the next revolution in healthcare, which I do think will be patient access to data. And um, a lot of people will say to me, OK, well, is it too damaging? What happens if the patient uses the data in the wrong way? What if it's too confusing, right? And it's an important question. Privacy is key, but it should always be under patient control. What I've learned very quickly is in healthcare and in politics, they aim for the worst case scenario all the time. If it's going to kill one person and save 1,000 people's lives, not going to do it. What we need to enable is instead of making worst case scenarios, for example, limiting me from accessing my own genome, they should allow patient choice. Right? Patients should be able to be partners. And to make sure that they know what they're doing, you know, for example, maybe you might think genetic data might be too complex and it might scare the person. Well, make the person pass a test. Make sure they understand the liabilities before they share that with the world. For example, if we go back to the Personal Genome Project, the one that I mentioned earlier, with, uh, which is now turned into open humans, people are sharing their genome online. Right? It sounds maybe risky. In order to do that, you have to pass a test. They give you this study sheet, and they talk about the risks. They say, you know what? Maybe in the future, some crazy terrorist might design a virus that targets you specifically and turns your hair green. Right? This, they might, some criminal might use it to plant your fake DNA on a crime scene. Right? These are all possibilities maybe in the next 100 years. And they want to make sure the person knows this is possible before they donate their data. So they actually make them pass a little test so that they confirm that this person knows what they're doing. And you know what? That is such a better process than what is currently done in healthcare, where I'm signing a 70-page document before surgery, and in very fine print somewhere it says, oh yeah, and the patient doesn't own any of their own tissue when they cut it out. Or in fire, very fine print it says, oh, and the patient won't get their DNA back because of the CALEA policy. Because you'd never find that it's in complex legal terms. right? And that's the current standard. right? So we need dynamic consent where patients understand. And to do that, what we can do is have access that's patient-centric and clear. And to do that, we can start with an open API. If you don't know what an API is, it's an application programming interface. What that means is it's a standard way to access data and share data. And it would be under the patient's control. And because it's open, this is the most important part, patients could choose to share it with third parties. So instead of me downloading the 30 CDs, I could say, you know what? This app is going to help research, because I'm donating my MRI to them. And in exchange, they've incentivized me because they're going to 3D print my skull and send it in the mail. So those researchers save $5,000 and the trouble of finding a patient from doing the MRI. And they just pay the you know, $50 to print the skull. Right? So as soon as you put into third-party hands, the whole equation shifts. 
Instead of doctors and hospitals having to develop the apps, third parties do. And this is what has changed the tech world, right? If we look at the examples, you know, this is how Google Maps, how Facebook, how Dropbox, they all work. Imagine with Google Maps, you could see routes that other patients took, right? With Facebook, there's over 1.9 billion people on it. 1.9 billion people. Imagine if only 0.0001% of those people shared their medical data. It's a small amount, but times 1.9 billion would be one of the biggest medical research studies in history, and it could be basically done at the cost for free, just for programming costs. And for Dropbox, right? Instead of me at Stanford having to have my CDs for my medical data, when you move hospitals, your, your data would, would stay together. So there's, there's all these enormous possibilities of if you open up to third-party developers. Right? Look at the two million apps on the App Store making your phone into anything you could dream of. Yet with our personal medical data, which is way more important, we have zero tools. Right? So an open API could help fix this. And actually, in the policy, uh, and I've been helping advocate for this, they've introduced a bill called Meaningful Use, Meaningful Use Phase 3, which requires by the end of 2018 to have a standard API that's accessible by patients. So we'll see with the current political situation if that holds. But if it does, it really could drive things. Um, so I want to also just quickly mention, at the end of the day, it's not all about the patient. Actually having that open API means that the friends and family could understand what's going on. So when I was putting all this data online, instead of having people always you know, asking how I'm doing, they could get that information and be informed, right? They could send gifts that were meaningful because they could see what I was going through, right? Doc doctors had me engage, I was engaged, right? I was listening, I was following treatment. Hospitals could have feedback and scientists could have context. So instead of a snapshot, you could have a lifelong view, right? Uh, and, and this was kind of a lesson that I want to end on. Um, I was very surprised as a scientist of the, the fact that sharing data generated support, which itself was a medicine. I never would have guessed that, right? So I shared my data online, and because of that, this amazing community saw what I was going through and supported me. And that was incredibly powerful for me when I'm going through chemotherapy, when I'm going through proton radiation, right? I never went alone, right? So I put all my data online, and I shared it with, with the world. And uh, right before my surgery, people had responded with videos. So I want to show you very quickly what I saw before going into surgery. And this features some of my favorite TV shows. Happy brain surgery, Steve. Hey, Steve, it's Jimmy Kimmel. We hope you get better. T-shirts. These? Happy brain surgery to you. Oh, Happy brain you. surgery to you. So my friends and family had done all that because I was sharing and they shared back, right? So even if you never use your medical data for anything, by having it, and maybe even only sharing it with your family, look what it can do, right? Uh, and so I want to end on a very personal note, but I first wanted to say to you all, please stay curious. Next time you're at the doctor's office, just ask the question, could I have access to my data, right? And if you have to fill out a piece of paper and wait two weeks in the mail, at least you'll have the CD. And maybe in 10 years' time, that CD may save your life. Or maybe it'll help someone else, right? Uh, so I want to end on a very personal note. Uh, first, I want to thank a lot of people, uh, doctors, friends, MIT community. Um, mentioned some references, because I've just recently graduated, so I'm still in this uh, custom of referencing. And I want to end on a very, very personal note. Um, this is something, uh, we know, put, my, put yourself in my shoes, okay? You're literally, you've got all kinds of stress and deadlines, things at work, and then you're told tomorrow, we're gonna cut out 10% of your brain uh, in three weeks' time. And by the way, it's in your frontal left lobe, which might have your language and your personality. Uh, right? I just wanted to share with you, I sent out an email to my family and friends uh, right before I went into surgery, kind of listing, you know, if I don't make it out, here's uh, what I think is important. So I'm going to share those <clears throat> last three points of that email from you just as a, as a way to share that perspective and to make you uh, feel a little better about your own deadlines. If you're panicking about something at work, there's bigger things out there, right? Perspective is everything, and switching shoes yields the most powerful thoughts. Family and friends are what remain when the world blurs. Gather data as often as possible and share it with the world. Could save your life one day. I never would have gone to the neurological folks if I didn't have the open data from the research scan. And then the very last line of that email. The world is a lovely, splendid, and fascinating place. But most of all to me, it's beautifully curious. So thank you all uh, so much for your time. 
Uh, I'm very happy. Uh, well, thank you. So I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions. I can also talk about random things up here. There's all kinds of more, more stories. So I wanted to keep it so we have enough time. How much time do you have? 20 minutes? 20 minutes, perfect. Yep. Hi. Uh, the open, I hadn't heard about the notes, and that's. Oh, sorry. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Had not Thank heard you. of open notes. Thank you. In order to spread that to all data, so it could be yeah. all your medical data, canister, um, can you do that within the existing HIPAA and other regulations right. around privacy, or do you need to change laws in order to be able to do that? Right. So that's a good question, and I think one of the most important things that we can do is make the public understand the current policies, because people say HIPAA all the time, and it sounds like this scary thing. HIPAA is actually for the patients. HIPAA makes it so that every patient has a legal right to access all their clinical data. And some doctors don't realize this. Some institutions don't realize that HIPAA is actually means the patient has to be able to get their data. So now that's just clinical data, which is important. But everyone should know in this room, if you're ever told you can't access your clinical data, you can say, well, the HIPAA policy says I can, and you can do it. And so that's been, there's been a big campaign by the government called the Blue Button Campaign, where they've been trying to make a, a single blue button that you should be able to press, and it'll, then your data will come to you. And that's great, but the problem with the big blue button campaign was that people would press the button, be all excited, and then they would get 30 CDs in the mail, and they'd be like, well, what the crap, what do I do with 30 CDs? And then they would upload the CDs, and they'd have nothing to do with the data. So while access to the clinical data is definitely important, what we really need is the ability to send it out to third parties. We need apps and tools to use that data, and it needs to be simple. It needs to be press a button on your phone and share it with this research group, and they'll make you an author on their paper. It needs to be press a button and you know, donate your data to research, and we'll make a medical selfie. Or press this button to share it with your family. Right? And now, you raise another good point, and I want to talk about policies too. So that's HIPAA. HIPAA is actually a good thing. Okay? It, it means that the patient has the right to access their data. Now, once a patient brings their own data out of HIPAA, they can do whatever they want with it. So it's, not, it's only HIPAA protected when it's not in the hands of the patient. So for a hospital, they have to protect the data because it's HIPAA protected, meaning no one can access it except for the patient and, and the researchers who are approved and the doctors. Now, once the patient has their own HIPAA data, they can do whatever they want with it. There's no constriction there, right? If you get your own data, you can put it online, you can do whatever you want with it. You can send it to whoever. But the problem is right now there's not standard formats, so it's very hard to send to anyone, and it's very hard to have any tools for it. Another policy that's important to note is CLIA. It's called the Clinical Laboratory uh, Improvement Amendment. And that was an, an, an 80s policy that was supposed to help patients but is totally not helping patients now. It was meant so that patients could only get data if it was done on a CLIA-certified machine. So back in the 80s, they were worried that certain laboratory test equipment at the hospital might not be checked enough, might go bad, and might give bad data to the patient. So back then, they required any data ever going back to a patient has to be on a machine that is regularly CLIA certified. Now, the problem is, is in today's term for research labs, they're not going to be CLIA certified because they're not going to pay the $50,000 and do that process to get it CLIA certified. And quite often, their machines are way better than the hospital machines. But because they're not CLIA certified, the patient can't have access to the data. So that's what happened with my, my genome. So basically, cutting edge technology at MIT best sequencers in the world, but because of the CLIA policy, they can't give me the data even though the researchers and the doctors can see it. So there's policies like this, and I am being very active in working on policy suggestions, and while I don't, you know, if you guys are able to, this is great, I would recommend you guys just ask your doctors for your data, but if you want to take the next step, people don't realize how much power patients have. I'll give you an example. So every time the US government's trying to pass a bill on healthcare, they'll put it out for policy comments, right? And anyone can comment, usually for two to three months. So say for the common rule or meaningful use phase three, and it's online, and you can submit any comment you want. You could write a one sentence saying, I'm a patient, I want my data, and it would go in. Now the really interesting thing, and I've seen this from behind the scenes being on the Precision Medicine Task Force, is they look at all those comments, and there might be 2,000 comments, but 99% of those comments are from the legal teams at the hospitals, because they're paid to be lobbyists, and quite often, they'll all say, well, we shouldn't give data to patients, it's too much money, and what if they hurt themselves with it? 
Now, for maybe the five or 10 patients letters that come in out of the 2,000, those are put in a separate pile. And the piles are somewhat weighed equally. So you've got your you know, thousands of lawyer letters, and then you've got your five patient letters. And they're viewed somewhat equally in that room. So if you are a patient and write a letter, it has way more of an impact than you might think. People will be mentioning that and discussing it. And it doesn't have to be complex. You can literally go in and talk about an experience that you had, and you could be like, how come I can't access my data? Or you know, how come when I moved to this different hospital, they weren't able to connect? Right? And, and suggest, you can just say your experience, or you can make suggestions. So if you're ever interested, that's an easy route where in an afternoon on your computer, you can affect policy. Right? Good morning. I've heard a lot of patient advocates speak, but none like you. So thank you so oh, much for a really you. fascinating talk. Yeah. I hope it was, I hope it was okay. <laughs> it was okay. Here's my question. Um, how does access to data yeah. help the oldest, sickest, frailest yeah. patients yeah. who, of course, make up most of what the healthcare system gives to patients? Yeah. How does the data become valuable for them? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a, an incredibly important question because I often am told, you know what, Stephen, you're a white unicorn. You know what? You are at MIT, you have this curiosity, uh, and you have all these professors around you that can help you. And I am a white unicorn. I understand not many people can enroll in med school just to get a little bit of their brain tumor, right? I understand that. Now, the, the, the thing is, right, look at the benefits that I got from having access and doing all that work. Everyone should be able to have those benefits, but they shouldn't have to do med school, right? It should be just like your iPhone. You can download two million apps. And one of those apps, you know what? They could do all of the stuff that I had to put all that work into, right? Look at Google Maps, right? Back in the day, we had all those maps, and it was really hard to figure out on paper where you're going. Now you just go to Google Maps, and it predicts you know, these different routes, and it shows you the different views. For a person that is sick, very frail, has no idea what to do, the simpler and easier we can make the tools and the access, the more people can use and benefit from them. So to be honest, all of this stuff that I'm proposing, it, it would help me, but it would help the frail and people who have uh, much less capacity to access that data way more. Because I already got the benefits, but I had to put in years of work and a lot of pain and struggle. What if that person you know, could, with a click of a button, get multiple opinions of treatments to go for. And they could actually make an informed decision without having to put in all that work. Uh, as, as, as I shown uh, and talked about, I learned the hard lesson the patient has to become their own advocate. With more tools, it makes it, that job a lot easier. So uh, the ability for this to help the people without the capacity to, to handle it is way higher than it is to help people like me who have that capacity and can put in that effort and time. Yep. Well, sort of a follow-on to that question. Sure. Are there any um, disciplines that you see are making progress in explaining the clinical record that a patient has access to yeah. in terms that they can do something with it. Yeah, sure. And so, maybe some areas, maybe liver, maybe heart, sure. maybe breast cancer are farther along. But it seems to me we have plenty of um, support groups, not nonprofits that get developed, but they're not providing this kind of help in accessing the data. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of small startups that are starting to push this work forward, things like Picnic Health. And there's a bunch of startups like that which are taking away the pain of doing all the stuff of getting the data. So for example, Picnic Health will go out, get your data for you, put it into a formatable terms that's easy for you to interact with. So there's groups like that that are trying to just make the data easier to view. There's uh, a whole other wide range. I think Open Notes is a really powerful example of showing that they've done something very practical that's having real results, right? 70% of people are treating themselves better because of, of Open Notes. In terms of data sharing, I think it's really interesting to see now that some insurance companies are taking steps to actually lower your coverage rates if you are constantly uploading data, say, through a Fitbit. So there are insurance companies now that are taking steps that say, look, if you wear a Fitbit and you connect it to our app, and we can track your health data constantly, we're gonna reduce your rates. Because we might be able to see that, you know, if you have slightly lower activity periods, you might be having certain conditions, and maybe we can prevent it ahead of time. 
So there's definitely interesting things that are happening on that front. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of change, especially uh, if the government pushes this policy for required APIs by 2000, end of 2018, which is a big one. And I know that there's a lot of startups and companies looking at that space. Uh, the, the biggest ones that I can recommend right now for any of you out there is probably patients like me, right? So that's the 500,000 people. Uh, open humans is right now, you can go there, put your data and use tools. Now there's not as many tools as we'd like, but anyone can make a tool if they're interested. So right now, if you go to Open Humans, there you can connect, I think, you know, it's about 40 or so different data sources. So you can connect your microbiome sequencing with your Fitbit data, with your 23andMe data, and all of these things. And you can choose, make it public or just keep it private, and you can choose which apps you want to use with it. And there's a whole host of these apps, and you can write an app too. So that's another example. Open Humans is definitely, we need more people on it. We need people uh, interested to write apps but I think it's a good model for how I think things will happen in the next few years. Yeah. With the hat. Just, uh, right there, with the blue shirt. I'd, I'd be redundant to say that this is just a fascinating presentation. Oh, I'm a PhD clinical psychologist by training, and one of the things that we bump into with a lot of data is a lot of data. Yeah. So okay. you're obviously intellectually trained to curate it and go through it. Are there organizations like Picnic Health that are looking at taking it a step further and creating medical chaperones that if you have a particular problem such as you had, you can give them the data and that medical chaperone goes through whatever and then guides you through this labyrinth of a hundred different decisions right. and hopefully gets you where you need to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not aware of any general services that, that do that specifically. It, it is, but I mean, the, with the more advanced care centers that you see, like the Mayo, Mayo Clinic and things like that, they do that, right? Um, and different groups and different apps do that on certain levels, uh, but definitely that's what we need. And the way to accomplish that is to have these APIs so that we can have third parties come in. You know, one of the really fascinating things is you go to a university and they'll often have hackathons where they'll get a bunch of students together who'll be working on problems. And they're all super excited to work on medical problems. They're ready with their computers to program and solve challenges for patients. And then they're like, we can't actually access the patient data. How do we get the patient data? And so again, you've got all of these researchers keen for real data. They want to do something instead of using dummy sample sets. And you've got all these patients who really want to connect with the researchers. And right now, the final point is this, it's called an institutional review board, the IRB at a hospital, which has to review and make sure all the research stuff is correct and then feed out to the patients. And while there's definitely ethical reasons for an IRB board, the problem is the funnel is a single hospital, right? So especially for people, uh, I mean, this, you were asking about people without out access or frail without access to service, I think is really important, especially for people in rural hospitals. Because rural hospitals often won't e even have any clinical trials going on, right? They won't have any research going on. So their doctors won't even recommend to look into clinical trials. So people in cities with big hospitals will be, have the option and be told about these clinical trials, whereas people in rural hospitals where they're not allowed aren't hold those questions. So that's where things like patients like me comes in where you can see whether people are asking those questions. But you, you raise a great point. Right now, the patient has to be their own advocate or their family members. And it's incredibly hard for people uh, to make, most of the time, they'll just go with whatever the doctor says, right? They'll view the doctor as God instead of a guide. And that is a problem. And I've seen that firsthand because I've talked to many doctors for my case and they'd have different opinions. And which opinion is best? Well, they have different disadvantages. I'll give you an example. For brain cancer, there's this new innovation where you wear an electrode cap. Okay? You wear a cap with a bunch of electrodes, and it puts electricity in your brain, and they found, amazingly, that it has similar effects to chemotherapy, which sounds great, right? A lot of people might recommend that. And then you talk to patients who have been on that, and when they say the same benefits as chemo, the benefits of chemo for really bad types of brain cancer, like GBM, is an extension of maybe three months of life. So you're gonna put yourself through wearing a cap every day of your life with electrodes carrying a big battery pack, you know, for six months to extend your life by three months. And you talk to those patients and they say, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe I'll want to die three months earlier, but not wear a friggin' battery and a cap with electrodes with gel on my head every day of my life, right? So that's, you know, that ability to, to navigate those decisions 
is much better when you have tools and you can see what other people are doing, uh, but there's, there's not a service like you're talking about that I'm aware of. Yeah. You're a great, is that talking? Yeah. Um, you're a great presenter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very important subject matter. I'm wondering from a philanthropic standpoint, yeah. um, how do you have a movement that can be supported? Are you taking this on and taking it further? It, uh, I, it's an incredibly important yeah. uh, matter, and I'd like to know how to get oh, behind great. it. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. Um, definitely talk to me afterwards if you want more information, but I would say Generally, so I'm on the board of directors for the Open Humans Project, and I think that's a really powerful one because that's the next iteration of the Personal Genome Project. You guys might have heard of the Personal Genome Project. It's very well known, started by George Church. That same platform has now taken an iteration and transformed into the Open Humans Foundation. So instead of just sharing genetics, you can now share anything. And it's a perfect model because it's pushing the boundaries. And it's a nonprofit, and it's supported in the past by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and a few others, and we really need that to scale. So I think that's one route which is supporting open humans. I think Open Notes, which is another nonprofit, is another one that can be really supported. I think pa patient advocacy groups uh, can be supported as well. Um, and, and talk to me afterwards, because I, I am doing some stuff uh, as well. Yep, in the back in the booth. Thank you for your question. Hi, uh, thank you. So I'm a physician, and I know for sure that patients who are engaged and informed and ask questions do better than patients that don't. So this is fantastic, Great. and I love Great. the direction this is going. Uh, my medical specialty is high-risk obstetrics, so I do uh, a lot of genetic prenatal uh -huh. diagnosis. So uh -huh. um, I'm finding out life-changing uh -huh. information about women's pregnancies and uh -huh. other health issues in pregnancy too, HIV uh -huh. and other you know, new diagnoses. Uh -huh. Our hospital has a uh, my patient my chart portal, and we release the results to patients through that within 24 hours of the test being done which um, in practice is really difficult to get a hold of a patient within 24 hours of the test results coming back. People right. don't answer their cell phones. Right. It goes to voicemail. They don't call us back. We're not a priority and we're not right. texting, you know. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of training in breaking bad news to people. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. think it's important to put life-changing medical information within a supportive context. You know, you talk about yeah. needing a chaperone or a guide. I would yeah. hope that would be... Yeah me as their physician yeah. as they're walking through this process. Yeah. I don't know how to balance that, wanting to be open and transparent with sure. patients, but at the same time, making sure they feel like I care about them and how sure. they receive these results and that they don't just see them flash up on a computer screen. Sure. So. Yeah. No, it's a very good point. And I think uh, the way, uh, one strategy to go about that is, for example, look at right now how phone apps are work, right? If you submit an app to the app store, it doesn't just go on there. It actually gets reviewed, and people make sure that it's safe, that it's providing accurate information, that it's not scamming you before they put it on the app store. So there's a preventative method there. You can imagine for health apps, maybe a hospital would be the app store. Maybe the hospital would validate these 15 apps we trust. We know that they're giving correct information and doing it in a meaningful way. And some of them might require that you come in and talk to a doctor before you can access things on the app. Just like for the Personal Genome Project, you have to pass the test before you can donate your data online. So we could think of it in that way, where maybe the hospital will, will have these recommended apps, um, but I think at the end of the day, it should be up to that patient to make the decision, how, how much of their data they want to see. And as long as they're making an informed decision, which is critical, then I th we should have a variability of what the patient can do. If they don't want to see any data, that's fine, right? If they only want to have their doctor tell them, that's fine. If they want to see everything, that's fine. If they want to donate it, great. But we need that flexibility. And this was the last question, we're just running out of time, so I want to end on a story that relates to this. So right now, a lot of the time, when you participate in a research study, the, the hospital's trying to protect you, and they say, we're gonna make all your data anonymous. And that's to protect you as a, as a research subject, right? I want to talk about why that can be problematic and why the patient should be able to have dynamic consent to make that decision. I want to talk about the Resilience Project. So I don't know if you've heard of it, this was done by Sage Bionetworks. They gathered all of this data from 23andMe, from Ancestry.com, all this genetic data donated by people. And when it was donated, they had all signed the form saying, oh, they'll keep it anonymous to protect me as a, as a, as a participant. Right? So 600,000 of these genomes were analyzed by researchers, and they were looking 
four specific traits in the genome that would say that the person should be dead or with the serious disease but was still alive. What they were looking for is people that should have cystic fibrosis or have Tay-Sachs disease or sickle cell anemia but don't or are not showing the symptoms of it. They were looking for superheroes. They were looking for X-Men. They found 13. 600,000 people, they found 13 people with genomes that should say they should be dead or having a serious disease, but they're not. Right? That's amazing. That's what big data can happen. That's what when crowdsourced data can, can do. But the problem was those researchers couldn't contact those 13 people. They couldn't contact them for more information, for more tests, to tell them they're a superhero, to tell them you might want to watch this in the future because it was all de-identified anonymous data. Right? So there has to be some way there that the patient can actually have a scale of dynamic consent. There is a, a need for protection and a need for privacy, but at the end of the day, it's all worst case right now and the patient should be able to make a choice. I think we're out of time, right? So thank you guys all for your time. Happy to chat afterwards.